All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Kosla. It's such an honor to be here. I think I've got my microphone here because I want to be able to hold my brain with my two hands here. <laughs> I made this through the, uh, through the screening today on the flight, and they, they did say there was something strange in my bag, so they wanted to take it aside and take a look at it. So this is, in fact, uh, my brain done uh, through a 3D printer after getting a full volumetric MRI, which I'm going to talk to you about. So it's, I think it kind of shows the power of MRI and quantitative MRI to actually be able to hold uh, what is like a pathological specimen, but I'm still alive, which is pretty cool. <laughs> so I'll talk to you a little bit about what we've been doing with that to try to help in the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And I'll just set it down there. It gets a lot of w work because I take it to students and show them. Uh, you know, it's a, I think it's a lot better than the plastic models that they have. This is an actual brain without all the smell of formaldehyde and such. So uh, it is really such an honor to be at UC San Diego. It truly is a a leading, the leading organization for Alzheimer's disease research, and I'll talk to you about that. But I came there straight after training up here in the Bay Area, did my MD, PhD at, at Stanford, and then off to Johns Hopkins for my neurology training. And when I decided to come to UC San Diego, none of those top institutions had any argument that this UC San Diego was the place for me to be because it is really the top, top of uh, Alzheimer's and imaging research. And so that's what I want to focus on. And, but broadly, there's, there's a huge, vibrant community of neuroscientists at UC San Diego and across the Mesa. So for anybody that grew up being fascinated with the brain, UC San Diego is really feels like just such a playground for neuroscience. It really is, I've heard it uh, be described as the highest concentration of neuroscientists in the world. And so it really is an honor to be there. So what do I do? I focus on Alzheimer's disease. I, I've been even since an undergraduate, uh, um, spent some time at UC Berkeley on Lawrence Berkeley Laboratories doing PET scanning of Alzheimer's patients and MRI scanning of Alzheimer's patients and became very engaged with those, uh, un those suffering patients and it really uh, changed my life because I decided I wanted to study this disease and tr do whatever I could to help uh, those patients. Uh, I'm uh, the director of the Human Memory Laboratory where we study normal, healthy, uh, aging and memory, but I also run the imaging core of the Alzheimer's Disease Cooperative Study, which is a center that runs about 80 sites across the nation for clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease. And all their brain images come to my lab to be processed using the tools I'm going to talk to you about. I also recently took the uh, directorship of the Shiley Marcos Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, which is really the hub of Alzheimer's disease research at, on campus at UC San Diego, and we've built huge collaborations not only with our local community, but also with uh, the surrounding industry, Qualcomm and uh, uh, Illumina, uh, all, all these wonderful biotech partners that we have. I want to tell you just that we at UC San Diego have been able to apply this superior expertise that is around in our radiology department for brain structure, brain function, blood flow, and whole body cancer detection and combine that with the unparalleled expertise in Alzheimer's disease that exists in UC San Diego and basically made this the UC San Diego being the foremost center for Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging. So let's talk a little bit about that. I can't uh, talk to you about Alzheimer's disease in the brain without mentioning this structure called the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the critical structure for forming new memories. And that area, if you lose that structure, uh, you're unable to form any new memories. Even things as salient as your own mother dying or man landing on the moon, as soon as you got that information, it would be gone if you didn't have this amazing structure called the hippocampus. This is a tiny little structure. This is a dissection that I did while I was teaching students up here in the Bay Area, uh, where I cut out the hippocampus of a pathological specimen, and I'm holding it in my hand here. Such a tiny structure, but it's the seat of all your memories, of, of forming memories. Why do they call it the hippocampus? Well, hippocampus means seahorse in Latin, and so it's thought to look like a seahorse. And I, to make that obvious to you, I laid the seahorse on top of there. Kind of, you can see it. Uh, but look at the dev devastating effects that Alzheimer's disease has on this structure. I and mean, it's essentially gone in this brain. You can see almost no hippocampus remaining, and that makes sense for a neurologist to basically say, well, why is this patient having memory problems? Well, they're missing the part of the brain that forms memories. 
So we knew that we could use this as a biomarker to detect not only the disease in the brain, but also to, affect, to see the effects of therapeutics that we're trying on patients. So we could actually measure the rate of loss of this tissue and see whether a drug is having an effect on that rate of neuronal loss. Because it is quite dramatic how the brain changes when it's faced with neurodegenerative disease. These happen over years and years, but with advanced computer vision approaches, we can detect these kind of changes in as short of a time as three months. Scan a person at baseline, scan them again three months later, and we can detect the subtle changes that have taken place. And so I mentioned that we can take almost a pathological specimen, such as with my brain, and to try to get people excited or interested in this, I've taken some very high profile people who've wanted to get their brains printed after seeing my brain, and I, I've printed about 40 brains of very high profile do donors and, uh, and CEOs of major companies to try to get them excited as I am about brain structure. Uh, so just to show you a little bit, because uh, it lays out the idea that basically you now have a static picture of your brain when you were this age. Now we can do it again in 10 years and say what has changed. But in fact, the computer's even better at doing that, so you don't really need to print out your brain to know what's changed in the past 10, 10 years. We can do rigid t uh, alignment of these structure images and see even in six months, there's change in structure that happens in a patient that has neurodegenerative disease. So how do we take a look at this and make use of it? Well, we've developed a tool to fully automate the segmentation of the brain. We've actually even brought it all the way through FDA clearance and CE mark clearance in Europe and we've, been, we've distributed this tool to over 500 sites and now over 100,000 brains have been segmented and quantified. We relate it to norms so that we can tell whether that person's brain is at the normal structure for their age or has it shrunken for their relative to the others of their age. And we develop reports that help the physician make a sense of whether this brain is normal or abnormal and how it's changing across time. With that, we also use other markers, other imaging techniques that can tell you whether the bad protein of Alzheimer's disease is depositing in the brain. That's amyloid imaging, and we can talk more about it. I don't have a lot of time for that. But. And then atrophy occurs still well before any cognitive complaint happens. The brain is very resilient to the amount of atrophy that builds up. So only, only five or seven years after you start showing pretty severe atrophy do you have cognitive complaints. And then memory starts to happen. So uh, we've developed these tools and applied them in uh, patients with Down syndrome, each of whom will get Alzheimer's disease eventually if they live long enough because they have an extra copy of the chromosome that produces the bad protein of Alzheimer's disease. And we can use that to help learn what is, uh, what is going on in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. We quantify that and we apply it in trials to decide whether a drug is having an effect. And this gives us a better assessment of the underlying pathology of Alzheimer's disease. It gives us a direct assessment of the neurodegeneration hap happening, and therefore a better understanding of the disease process and thus a more efficient assessment of therapies in our very highly characterized cohorts. Thanks very much for your time.